Hey everyone, and welcome back to Joey's Retro Newscast, where I go over the top news of the last week in retro handhelds, retro gaming, and just gaming in general. We've got a lot of software news, we have a lot of device news, nothing for game news. So let's just jump right in. You might have missed this news a few weeks back, but there is a standalone Flycast Dreamcast emulator for Android that's available, and it's actually on the Google Play Store. Now, the reason I'm bringing it back up again is because they just released version 2.4, and it adds retro achievement support, and it also adds force feedback, which means you could use racing wheels with it, is my understanding, because I've only ever seen force feedback when it comes to racing wheels. And as somebody who has a dedicated sim racing setup, that's actually really cool. Now, I haven't actually personally tried this yet. I've been meaning to, I just haven't had a chance, but it is on the Google Play Store, so it's very easy to access and just grab it if you want it. Panda 3DS is also now available on Android. And Panda 3DS is a 3DS emulator, of course, but it's a bit behind what Citra and Lime 3DS are at, although Lime 3DS is really Citra, but either way, you know what I mean. It is behind in development, but it is still another option for 3DS emulation. So if you want to give it a shot, check out their GitHub and you can grab the latest release and just play it on Android. Probably the most important news of the week, Sync Thing for Android is being discontinued. And this isn't a complete shocker. It was removed from the Play Store a few months back, if I remember correctly, and they just stopped development on it. You couldn't get it. Most of us swapped over to the Sync Thing fork, and that is available on GitHub, it's available on the Play Store, and it's also available through F-Droid. So you have a few options there. And it is basically the exact same thing. Some UI elements are moved around and all of that, but it is Sync Thing for Android. It's just the official version is no longer being maintained or developed for Android. So what you can do is just export your configuration and everything from SyncThing to SyncThing Fork and just continue on your merry way using that instead. All of my guides going forward are going to use SyncThing Fork, so we'll make that change. But either way, just be aware, the SyncThing Android official app is being discontinued and so you should move over. Beacon Launcher has just added support for Sudachi and CMU. They also made some other changes and fixes and all of that, and Beacon is just an awesome, minimalistic front-end launcher for Android. So think of a Daijisho, an emulation station. Beacon is like that, except just a lot more minimalistic. And so I actually really like it in a lot of different scenarios. I've had some issues over it skipping files or missing games, and that's why I mostly use Daijisho nowadays but I still like Beacon quite a bit, and I'm sure they've probably fixed a lot of the bugs that I've experienced over the time since uh, the last time that I've used it. The AYN Odin 2 Portal officially went up for pre-order this week, and it's been selling really well. We are now up to 1,100 backers. We're actually just past 1,100 backers as of Thursday morning, which is when I'm recording this. Now that number is meaningless without comparison. So 1,100 backers is actually about three times, a little bit under three times, what the Ionial Pocket Evo did through the entire run. And we just did that in a day for AYN Odin 2 Portal. Also, the Odin 2 base did about 2,300. I forgot to put the number on, but it was about 2,300 in a month and we just did 1,100 in a day. I don't think it's gonna pass the Odin 2's full run, which was about 5,000 something. The Odin 2 sold really well. So I don't think it's gonna pass that, but to do almost half of what the Odin 2 did in a month is crazy. And it just shows that there is actual excitement. There is actual people that want this. There is actual a need for this. And I say that to say because I saw some weird takes online that nobody's buying this and it is crazy that certain SKUs are still available after a few hours and all that sort of thing. And I just, I just assume they're out of touch a little bit. And like, look, if I get that you like your Steam Deck a lot, but not everybody does. Not everybody wants a Steam Deck. Not everybody is looking for a Steam Deck. A lot of people want something like this. And so this is for them, but not everything needs to be a just buy a Steam Deck, bro. The Steam Deck is great, but it is not always the answer. My lord, think outside the box. Special note for Canadians, they are using DHL to ship here by default for us in Canada. And if you don't want that, which you shouldn't, you can email them to change it to 4px. And I suggest that you do this because DHL is going to cause you a lot of duties and fees. 4px is not at all. 
So you're going to save some money. It's going to take a week longer to deliver, but you're saving money. So trust me, just change it to 4PX. I spoke to AYN about review units and they told me it's going to be December. So we probably won't talk about this for a little bit longer unless some major news comes out, but keep an eye out. We'll talk about it when we get more to talk about. Speaking of the Pocket Evo, the INEO Evo and DMG are both delayed by a few weeks to a month. They're offering a $20 coupon for you to purchase anything on their website for anybody that is affected by this delay. Look, if there was ever a time where they needed to ship something really quickly, it would have been this. And if you go and look at their uh, Indiegogo page right now, it is just full of cancellation requests. This is a weird one. And I, we went over this already. I'm not going to rehash the entire argument here, but they are competing devices. It isn't a case where one is blowing away the other in specs and all of that. They are very much competing devices. And it is super interesting to see how a mismanagement of launching and releasing and all of that is the cause for the complete difference in how well each SKU is doing or how well each device is doing. The portal is running away with it, of course. But it just makes you wonder because these devices are competing. They're there is a lot of things that the Evo does well, and there's a lot of things that the Portal does well. There is no rhyme or reason why the Portal should be three times ahead in sales. And it's just all down to the releasing, the launching, and the just mismanagement on IENEO's front that they continue to do. So not going to rehash it, but it is, again, just super interesting now seeing sales numbers, how different it is. So it looks like the Retroid Pocket Mini has some issues with displaying shaders. From my understanding, as somebody who actually never uses shaders, the console is outputting 960p, but it is stretching the panel resolution to 1280p. And that's what I gleaned from reading this off of the subreddit. A user there, Streamin or Stremin, on the SBC Gaming subreddit, did a way better job of explaining all of this than anything I would understand. So if you want to get an idea of what's going on exactly, I would suggest that you check out that Reddit post. Now, if you're wondering how this gets missed during reviews, I'm not sure on everybody else's part, but for me specifically, I can talk about it. I don't use shaders. It, it's, that's, that's it. I just, I don't use shaders. I don't use overlays. I never do any of that. And so even if I were to turn on shaders, I would not know what to look for. I, it's not, when you're used to something, when I go and do a Super Mario World test and I'm trying to see D-pad usage and all that and frames and all that, you tell pretty quickly something's wrong because you're used to doing it all the time. I play Super Mario World all the time. I don't use shaders, so if I would have turned on shaders, never would have noticed it. And so that's how I miss it, and it isn't meant to be uh, an excuse in any way, shape, or form, but just explaining how it's something that gets missed on my end, at least. It's just not something that I test for because it's not something that I care about, and so shaders aren't something that I'm really interested in at all. And I think most people who watch my channel know this because you've been watching me for a while, and you know that I never show shaders, I never show overlays. Most of my guides show you how to remove them, and so it's not something that you expect from me, I think. But... It is something that gets missed, and it's unfortunate that it does get missed. Retroid is aware of the issue. They are looking into it and seeing what is going on here. I don't know an ETA on a fix. I don't know if a fix is available. I know nothing else. And if you want to keep up to date, I would suggest the Retroid Discord. But also, as soon as I hear anything, I will share it on Twitter or here or wherever else. Because usually I share a lot of things on Twitter and then here and I guess now Blue Sky and Threads and Instagram. There is too many social medias out there. Analog 3D pre-orders went live this week, and as of Thursday, this morning again, black is still available, but white is sold out. I have to wonder what they did differently this launch, if it's just a case of less people being interested or what it is, but the fact that they still have some stock available is really good for Analog. When I went to purchase it at launch, the website didn't crash, nothing was out of stock, nothing didn't work, everything was fine. The only problem I had was trying to snag one of the 8-bit Doe N64 controllers. I had to pick the white one because the black either didn't go in stock or went out of stock right away. And so I'm stuck with the white one, which is still in stock and you can still buy it, but I really wanted the black one. Now, the Analog 3D is obviously a niche purchase, and I think most of us are hoping that it gets hacked to allow N64 ROMs to be used instead of cartridges. But I do have some cartridges around that I can use either way, but that's my hope and what I'm waiting for. 
I'm honestly pretty excited for this. N64 emulation is hit and miss. And Mr. FPGA N64 emulation is also hit and miss. And so they are saying that this will be 100% compatibility and also goes up to 4K. We'll see what that actually comes out to when it releases. But that's my hope. That's what I'm banking on. And if it doesn't, then I'll just get rid of it. But that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so I've seen some pictures and rumors floating around that there's an Ambernic RG Arc XX coming and basically an H700 version of the RG Arc. It's great to have options, right? Look, this is nothing official. This is rumors and speculation and all of that. So don't hang your hat on this. And also, is there anybody out there who has an Arc or didn't have an Arc and wants this instead? Performance wise, the RK3566 and the H700 are on par and people are gonna get mad at me for this. But for 99% of people, they are on par. You could point to weird outliers of why one chip is better than the other and the RK3566 would come out ahead. But for most people, they are on par. It isn't worth making a whole RG arc just to use the H700 instead of like a T820, which is what I think most people would want, or higher. So, yeah. So I guess if you want an RG arc XX, you might have one soon, hopefully. Uh, good luck to you and Ambernic. That's all I got. I was asked this week if I wanted to review the Ambernic RG406P from Go Game Geek, and I'm now confused. I don't even know what this is. I, I didn't know this was a thing. I had seen blueprints months ago of this, and I'm like, okay, just blueprints. Then we'll wait for something, some sort of tease, because usually it doesn't go from blueprint to, hey, do you want to review this? You usually get some weird tease, some box, something. This has nothing. It very much looks like a flat retroid pocket, and by the 406P, I assume that it's going to have the T820 inside of it. That's the same in the 556 and the Cube and the 406V. And it's supposed to have a 4-inch 4x3 720p screen. That's the same in the 406V once again. So once again, I'm very confused here. Go Game Geek never reaches out to me to review a device that isn't known. They're usually late on these sorts of things. And so I guess this is real. I guess this is coming. I don't know anything else. I know nothing more. I would have to talk to the Ambernick marketing team and they don't talk to me anymore, but it seems like they've really expanded that marketing team to include others, but whatever. Honestly, after seeing the Retroid Pocket Mini and the Retroid Pocket 5, probably zero interest in this either way. A T820 just doesn't interest me, but depending on the price, if you're going to put it at 170, 180, no. If you're going to put it a lot lower and in a way that it's nowhere near the 5 or the Mini, then we'll be interested and then we'll look at it. But let's keep an eye on this and I'll let you know as I hear any more uh, updates as they come. There are a lot of pictures of a trim UI brick floating around in a red and a purple and a black and a white. And I spoke to Go Game Geek about this and they let me know that the white and black are the only confirmed launch date colors. The red and purple are there but they're not confirmed and it's mostly an incentive apparently of if white and black sell really well they will do other colors that's what they told me i don't know what the real story is but doesn't seem like red and purple are going to be launch colors so if you want to wait for that you might want to wait it's not confirmed they're going to come so you might shoot yourself in the foot if they don't now trim ui doesn't do review units ahead of time they did send out dev units to a lot of different developers and they're, they're all working on getting custom firmware and stuff up and running for this. Apparently Crossmix already works with this out of the box, I think. I Don't quote me on that, but that would be great if it does. If it doesn't, probably won't have to wait that long. We'll see what other custom firmware comes out. I know the MUS team is getting it because Gamma helped them get it and I was forcing Gamma to help them get it. <laughs> but either way, MUS on the Trim UI brick would be fantastic. Crossmix on the Trim UI brick will be fantastic. I am very, very excited for this device. If my videos have been helping you, consider supporting me on Patreon or just give this video a like and a sub. You can also come join me on the Discord and we talk all about retro handhelds all the time. Like I said before, no game news this week, so appreciate you all for watching. And that's all for me, Edmonton.